Hey, it's Craig. I just wanted to let you know that you can listen to Canadian History X early and ad-free on Amazon Music, included with Prime. Greetings and welcome to another episode of Canadian History X. Before I continue, I want to say thank you to Scoobable58 who left a 5-star review. I really appreciate these 5-star reviews because they help me move up the rankings and they show that people are enjoying the podcast. So thank you. If you want to support the podcast, you can for as little as $3 a month. Just go to patreon.com slash CanadaEHX. You can also donate to the podcast by going to CanadaEHX.com and clicking donate. Don't forget, I have two other podcasts out there, From John to Justin, which releases every Friday, as well as my brand new podcast releasing tomorrow, May 2nd, called Canada's Great War, where I look at the entire First World War and how it impacted Canada. So do check them out. And you might notice that things sound a bit different. I recently moved and I'm in a new studio and it might sound a little bit different, but I'm hoping to get all the kinks worked out. He is one of the most important Indigenous individuals of the past 1,000 years and arguably the most important Indigenous person from pre-contact that we know of. His name was Hiawatha and he would bring peace to the five nations of the Seneca, Cayuga, Onondaga, Oneida, and Mohawk to create a confederacy that would become a major political force for centuries. It should be noted that I am not talking about Hiawatha in the Henry Wadsworth Longfellow poem, The Song of Hiawatha. It is not known when Hiawatha lived, with some records putting him living from 1525 to 1565, while other records have his life from 1400 to 1450, and others having it even 500 years previous. As such, he is mixed between the oral histories told by the indigenous about him and the legends that sprang up around his life. As a result of this, it is said there are no two versions of the story of Hiawatha that are the same. In some stories, he is a heroic figure similar to George Washington, while in other stories he is a mythical figure such as Odysseus. One of the first discrepancies is over which indigenous nation he was part of, with some claiming he was Mohawk and others claiming he was Onondaga or even the farther away Mi'kmaq. During the life of Hiawatha, the indigenous people of the region around the Great Lakes were involved in the Morning Wars, or what the Europeans would call blood feuds, that created a never-ending cycle of violence fueled by vengeance for past deaths and deeds. Among the indigenous tribes of the region, there was a tradition of replacing fallen warriors with captives taken in battle to help mourners deal with the death of their loved ones. Unfortunately, this caused the cycle of vengeance to keep going, with neighboring nations trying to take their own captives to replace the members of their nation taken as captives. As wars continued, famine grew because it depleted the stores of the villages and hunters who would have been out getting food were now involved in the business of war, which meant many communities had no food to get through the winter months. It was in this world of violence that Hiawatha came into the picture. Very little is known about Hiawatha beyond his life slightly before and after the founding of the Confederacy. He's also known as Ayanwatha and Hainwentha, or He Who Combs. In the story of Hiawatha, three main individuals feature, and I will cover all three because each gives a glimpse into the violence that was plaguing the five nations at the time, and each has their part in the overall story. The first figure is Hiawatha himself, who was an Onondaga or Mohawk warrior, that lost his wife and daughters as a result of the blood feuds. With the loss of his family, Hiawatha falls into a deep depression and he began to wander the lands of the Haudenosaunee grieving their loss. As a result, Hiawatha is a representation of the victims of the violence that everyone had to deal with. The second figure is Atatoro, who was the war chief of the Anadaga. He represents the aggressors of the blood feuds and it is said he controlled dark magic and had snakes in his hair. Using his magic, he prevented the councils of the Onondaga from conducting open discussions and councils to deal with the violence. No one spoke against him as there was fear of his temper and violent nature. The second figure is the great peacemaker or Daganawida. He was said to come from the north, possibly the area of the Huron people, to bring his message of peace to the five nations. 
A fourth figure is also present in some stories called Jigan Sase, or the Peace Queen, whose approval of the message of the great peacemaker symbolizes the need for gaining consent of a council of women before any major political actions are taken. According to the oral histories, it was Hiawatha and the great peacemaker who became the founders of the Great Law of Peace and the Iroquois League. The League is represented by the Longhouse and the Haudenosaunee became the people of the Longhouse, with the Longhouse becoming sacred among them. According to some archaeological evidence, it's believed that the League was founded sometime in the late 1400s. As for how that came about, it all came down to two men meeting each other and sharing a common goal of ending the violence. According to oral histories, the great peacemaker's grandmother had a dream that her daughter would have a son that would bring a message of peace and power from the chief of the great sky spirits to the warring nations across the water or great lakes. According to the histories, the great peacemaker was born around 1390, and when the child grew up he stated his desire to sail across the water and bring his message of peace and power to the five warring nations. He then took a canoe of white stone across the lake, and the great peacemaker then traveled from one village to another, telling about his message of hope. The great peacemaker also traveled down from his homeland to live with the Mohawk, and it was here that he met Hiawatha, who was in self-exile dealing with the death of his family. The two men began to speak and realized they both shared the common goal of ending the blood feuds. At the time, Hiawatha was described as a man who had a clouded mind and who could not think clearly as his rage had taken away his sense of reason. In order to help him deal with his grief, the great peacemaker conducted a ceremony of condolence, which he taught to Hiawatha. He taught him that anguish had the ability to push those who survived the terrible wars into deep despair, just like Hiawatha, and that it was harmful not only to themselves but to the community as well. The great peacemaker told Hiawatha that the blood feuds had to be replaced with peace, and that it was through the condolence ceremony that it could be done. The condolence ceremony, which could only be done by someone who had an unclouded mind, consisted of wiping the eyes of the weeping mourner so that they could see, then opening the ears so they could hear, and clearing their throat so they could speak. When the ceremony was done to Hiawatha, he suddenly found that he was no longer having pain or sorrow and that his reason had returned to him. The key to the ceremony was forgiveness, and Hiawatha discovered that he had been unable to forgive his enemy, and without forgiveness, he could not unite the nations. The ceremony was only one part of the ritual which included the wampum belt that would record the agreements and the re-quickening ceremony that was the ritual of adapting a member of another tribe as the re-embodiment of a loss within the tribe to provide balance. With this, Hiawatha would unite the five nations. According to some oral histories, the reason that Hiawatha was the one to spread the message of peace for the great peacemaker was because the great peacemaker had a speech impediment. As the disciple of the great peacemaker, Hiawatha preached about the condolence ceremony and how it had helped him, and he kept a wampum to remind him of the ceremony which he wore around his neck and to ensure that he did not forget how to conduct the ritual. Hiawatha began by going to the Mohawk and then making his way eastward to the Oneida, and both nations, after one year, approved the message of the great peacemaker. He then returned to his home village with the Onondaga, and Atatoro was approached with a new message of peace. Since Atatoro had risen to power through the wars, he did not want peace, but Hiawatha continued on to the Cayuga and Seneca, who both approved of the message of the great peacemaker. With four of the nations aligned, they approached Atatoro, who refused once again. The four nations then spoke with Hiawatha and asked him why they couldn't just coerce him and his nation by force into the Confederacy now that they were stronger together. Hiawatha refused this as he believed that this would create a stain on the founding of the Confederacy. To appease Atataro, Hiawatha offered him the role of the great chief and ensured that his home in Onondaga would be the meeting place of the Grand Council, which was the ruling body of the chiefs of the Haudenosaunee. And with this, he agreed, and the Confederacy was born. The creation of the Iroquois Confederacy would have a long-lasting impact, and it would ensure that the member nations stayed strong and united for the next 30 years, 
and served as important military allies to the French, English, Dutch, and Americans over the course of the centuries. The Hiawatha Wampum Belt is a visual record of the creation of the Iroquois Confederacy, and it consists of 6,574 beads in 34 rows by 173 rows, with 892 white and 5,682 purple beads. The purple beads represent the sky and the universe, and the white represents the purity and good mind. In the center of the belt is the symbol of the Confederacy, a great white pine or tree of peace. And it was under this tree that the weapons of hate, jealousy, and war were buried. It also represents the Onondaga Nation, where the Central Council Fire resides. The other nations are represented in squares on the belt. The white open squares are connected by white band beads that have no beginning or end, and the band does not cross the center of each nation, which shows that each nation is supported and unified by the common bond. Back in the 1990s, there was a Heritage Minute about this ceremony and about the tree. This tree represents our people. What kind of tree is it, Duda? A tree of great peace. The peacemaker gave the great laws of peace to the Iroquois in the dark times many years ago. Hainwata spoke for the peacemaker. You chiefs have brought ruin and despair to your children through war. We must fling this burning demon into the underground river to be carried away forever. Peace now. Peace. And the power of the great peace drove the evil from them. Does the great peace still have power? You're here, aren't you? It is not known when Hiawatha died, but it's believed that he is buried on the shores of Lake Superior. In 1988, the United States Congress stated that the Confederacy of the Thirteen Colonies was influenced by the Iroquois Confederacy, as were many of the principles of democracy that would be put into the United States Constitution. Hiawatha has been honored extensively in North America as a result of his role in creating the Confederacy. In the United States, a 52-foot-tall statue honors him, as does the Hiawatha National Forest in Michigan. In Canada, several locations also bear his name, including the Hiawatha First Nation. The members of the Hiawatha First Nation named for the man who brought a democratic peace to his people would be the first Indigenous in Canada to vote in a federal election, in this case a by-election, without losing their treaty status. I hope you enjoyed that episode and my look at Hiawatha. And if you did, please leave a rating and review. If you like, you can reach me through email at craig at canadaehx.com. You can also visit my website where you'll find hundreds of articles on Canada's history as well as all my podcast episodes. Just go to canadaehx.com. And don't forget, you can support the podcast through Patreon. There are multiple tiers to choose from, all with great benefits. You can support the podcast for as little as $3 a month just like all of these wonderful patrons have, and I apologize if I mispronounce any names. Doug Campbell, Reg W., Deborah Carlson, Francis Helbling, Randall McCallum, Diane Wade, Lorianne Kirby, Gary Dolovich, Nick Zinri, Shannon Marshall, Clinton Martinez, Dimitri Chauve, Aaron O'Hara Myers, Robert Dunseith, Todd Casey, Catherine Rawa, Luke S., J.P. Bear, Jason Hall, Phil Maynard, and Iris Gray. If you want, you can find me on Facebook. Just go to facebook.com slash CanadianHistoryX. You can find me on Twitter. My handle is Craig Baird, C-R-A-I-G-B-E-A-I-R-D. And you can find me on Instagram. Just go to Bairdo37. Information comes from Canadian Encyclopedia, New World Encyclopedia, Wikipedia, NativeLanguages.org, Onondaga Nation, and Tales from an Empty Cabin. Thanks, and we'll see you again next time.